Um, so I think there's a common theme running through all four papers, uh, and that is how should we use academic research to inform election administration decisions and talk about how that uh, falls out. We have three papers on the same topic, essentially, which is um, the subjective statements that voters make about their confidence in the electoral process, in particular, their confidence that their votes were counted or that the election <coughs> outcome was um, properly recorded. And we have a, a separate treatise or beginning of a book by Walter on uh, vote counting and auditing. Um, the, the, I, uh, all three, uh, all four uh, works are well worth reading. Um, Walter's is in the process, so it might be even the most rewarding read of all because it just stimulates a lot of thinking. And I have a few concrete suggestions. I'll first talk about Walter's work and then I'll turn to the other three and make some general over, overarching comments. The, the first comment is that this, is, uh, this work is an important set of developments and an application of statistical techniques, um, largely adopted from probability theory and accounting. Um, and it, it tries to grapple with the general question of how do you know what manipulated elections look like? Right? And I think it might be useful to flip that question on its head at some point in the book as well, which is, how do you know what a clean election looks like? Right? So if you can s answer both questions, both sides of the questions, you get a lot of leverage over the problem. And a lot of t one of the things that Walter's pointing to is a lot of the times when a, statist a statistical technique such as Benford's Law is applied to a, a election auditing or accountability, the obverse question is not asked. The question is how does an, a manipulate, what does a manipulated election look like, but what is a clean election is never asked. And what Walter is suggesting is we could have a bunch of perfectly clean elections that look manipulated, but that's because the alternative hypothesis has not been thoroughly thought through by the researchers. And that's the way I would, I would sort of frame um, what Walter is up to. And really what he's pointing to is that the pure application of Benford's law is perfectly fine. And what Benford's law is, is suppose you start counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now look at your first digit, the zero, the, the digits in the one column. You got a zero, a nine, an eight, seven, a six, et cetera. Those are uniformly distributed, but you've got a one. So now keep counting. And the Benford observed that if for any set of counted numbers, um, you get ones in the first digit a lot more frequently than twos and threes and fours, and then also the second digit, he's also got another distribution. So it's just picking up what the distribution of no digits is in counted large numbers. So you can look at money, you can look at, and banks use these kinds of laws a lot, you can look at votes, you can look at all sorts of applications to see if there's something irregular. And what Walter's pointing out is that in the application of this concept to elections, the researchers have ignored the heterogeneity in elections. So you've got one precinct that's big and one precinct that's small, so the counts are going to be different right, fundamentally. And when, and when you start thinking about the politics underneath the heterogeneity, um, it's not clear what the clean election would look like and that the clean election would be distinguishable from the, the manipulated election. I think there's a, an important cautionary tale because there was a rush, especially after the 2000 election, there was a rush to apply a lot of these statistical and accounting tools to aggregates in uh, ill-informed and ill-advised ways, and I think this is a, a very sensible approach to this. I think Walter's missing like the first 50 pages of the book. Sorry, Walter. The excerpt. <laughs> um, which is that uh, you know, both of us do a lot of uh, uh, data collection in this domain, and um, what's missing is that part of the project, which is when you try to assemble election data, it's really difficult really painful. For those of you in the room who've done this, you know the experience. Things don't add up and so forth. I was just telling Walter about looking at the M Michigan reports and the, count the precinct level Michigan reports have every county has a little line that says statistical adjustment. It's like <laughs> 400 votes. Like, what in the world is statistical adjustment in election data? We don't usually think of that occurring. And there are you know, repeated stories about local election officials in the United States not being able to get the books to balance at the end of the day, not wanting to be audited, not wanting to be dragged before the Secretary of State, uh, or worse, a court. And so they just kind of make up some numbers to make sure everything adds up to 100%. We see that after the fact in going through these data. I think that piece of the project is incredibly valuable to document 
you know, how did you, how did you collect the data and so forth. And there's a lot of variation. Like in Spain, you can get not just the precinct level data, you can get the table level data. Like several tables in a voting booth, you can get the table level data. It's pretty impressive um, what, we can, what we can look at. That first aggregation, I think, is actually our first check at the integrity of elections. Do things add up? Um, confidence and so forth is all very downstream if it matters at all by the time we get that far downstream. The real evidence about the integrity of elections in the US or elsewhere is does stuff add up? And Walter <coughs> and I see repeatedly weird stuff, even in very sophisticated, um, well-funded uh, fu uh, activities. And I think it would be very interesting to see a treat an exposition of that in, at the beginning of the book. And you might come up with some very useful results for the rest of us to, to start to think about. In particular, um, putting on my uh, hat of someone who wants to make things work a little bit better, um, I think it would be very useful if Walter or someone out of the Caltech MIT project or out of our shop or, or out of any shop develop some very simple to use spreadsheets that any local county official or state official or government official in any entity could, could apply to make sure that their counts work that was separate from what was provided for, to them from their data vendor. Their data vendor provides them something. The data vendor has an interest in providing the counts, making sure the counts come out a certain way. But if there was an independent audit tool that they could just plug in the numbers and say, does this look kosher, that would be unbelievably useful to every election uh, official. And I think it would be picked up um, fairly quickly. Um, there are a fair number of complications that would be worth discussing further. But um, I would also urge Walter to think about another linkage, and that's the link to the computer science literature. It's a very large, uh, very interesting computer science literature that's grown up since 2000 on the security of the vote. And it takes a very different approach. Rather than think about aggregates as aggregates, which is most of what Walter's work is about, they think about verifiability of an individual's vote. This is the great unsolved problem in every electronic system in the world. And voting is a terrific model to solve the healthcare auditability and records management system problem, the banking system problem, and so forth. And that's why computer scientists like Ron Rivest, who is the R in RSA Securities, is interested in voting. Because if you can figure out how to secure a vote in a way that nobody else can tell how you voted, but you can tell whether your vote was counted and cast as you intended, which is the question that the other three papers pertain to, then you've solved the problem, right? Because any voter can make sure that the election tabulation worked properly and that their ballot was not destroyed and so forth. That's coming at it from the individual level. Walter's coming at it from the aggregate level. Uh, I'd, I'd be very curious to see if there was any place where the two could meet or, where, or if we would know when the two met. Um, and there are interesting um, numerical results on how the aggregation process works because that whole, the whole field of cryptography is about how do you uh, verify things by looking at um, uh, the properties of aggregates, actually, rather than at individual level numbers. Let me turn to the papers on public perceptions um, and say, first of all, as someone who's written in this domain uh, a little too much, um, that I'm very skeptical about the meaning of public perceptions. Um, and I think all three papers ref reflect the same skepticism. As soon as you start to dig into this, you, you come up with all sorts of problems and the questions of voter confidence, voter efficacy, and so forth. In fact, these questions go back to the 1940s. The American National Election Study has been asking about voter efficacy since the 40s. And it always shows up that the winners feel that their votes counted, feel that they mattered more, et cetera, even though all votes essentially count the same. Um, and this is the theme that shows up in all three papers that all three authors are trying to grapple with in different ways. How, why is it that the winners are confident and the losers are not confident, even in systems that we think are reputedly clean, like the US elections? Um, and when we move out of the US context, what, is it, what do public perceptions mean? Um, in the US, we don't see uh, people going to the streets which would be another form of public expression of uh, lack of confidence in the election outcome. But presumably, that's the end point of 
a, a loss of confidence. So in the comparative context, you might think of the loss of legitimacy as the extreme example of the lock, lack of confidence in elections. So surely there's some meaning to this. How do we, I think the problem is, how do you extract the meaning of lack of voter confidence that is tied to legitimacy and is not tied to sour grapes? Because the theme that runs through all three papers is there's a large chunk of sour grapes in the lack of voter confidence, and that's mainly what it is about. Um, I think there's a very good puzzle that Thad put his finger on, but it shows up in all three papers as well, um, which is why is it that the new forms of voting, such as electronics, such as absentee and early voting, seem to <coughs> bring about less confidence, even though that's something in the case of absentee and early voting that the voters themselves are choosing to do. You have a choice between casting an early vote or going to the precinct, in the case of Paul's paper, and yet people are casting an early vote and are unhappy about it. <laughs> what is that about? Very puzzling, very odd. Um, I think the, the last, uh, sort of my last comment on this is that the voter confidence debate really needs to be thought about in terms of specific language in the context of specific legal and legislative debates. The Crawford debate, which uh, each of you touched on, uh, was really about specific language about voter impersonation. That's what the court case was about. Were people going in and pretending to be someone else? Um, the language has been, that language has been captured by the left and the right in terms of voter impersonation versus voter disenfranchisement. And we see increasingly partisan polarized language around this. But it's all going to come back to us later this year uh, if the Supreme Court of the United States does violence to the Voting Rights Act and strikes down Section 5, because that's going to throw into question a large number of court cases that have already been decided in the last year and a half on voter identification and voter impersonation and security. And the fundamental question is going to be, where do we go next um, in the voter ID, voter um, integrity direction? And in particular, what happens to the Voting Rights Act in the United States and how might it be reconceived? Uh, we have nine minutes uh, for Q&A, so we can open it up for a couple questions and then give the panelists a couple minutes to respond. Yes. Uh, yes, they are making... Making its way to you slowly. Um, a brief comment kind of taking off on Stephen's very insightful remarks. My name's Fabrice Liuk from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Should we really be trying to separate the sour effects effect? Because it seems to me, if you look at Chris Anderson's work and other people's work in Lose, Loser's Consent, the work that we've seen here, your good remarks, is that's a fundamental part of what's going on here. Perhaps election administrators to cite someone say, it's frustrating for me if you show me that losers are always going to evaluate this process worse differently than winners. But it seems to me that then puts the emphasis in what theoretically seems to me a more compelling factor to focus on, which is the way institutions, things from formula to whether you have a parliamentary system or presidential system, translate voter preferences to outcomes. That's making the whole point. You can't expect a group of people who consistently lose an election to give it high remarks. Those charges ring hollow. So I'm wondering whether instead of trying to tease out this effect, we should accept it and think about the implications that means both for design as well as for research. Leontine Luber, Council of State of the Netherlands. Um, I did some research on the um, winner-loser effect in the Netherlands and found that it's not, well, it's not really there. Um, we have a coalition system, so it's also very hard for people who vote for a certain party to know uh, if they are a winner or a loser and they can, their party can lose and they can still become part of government. And then I looked at the um, arguments political parties used in debates on changes in election law, and I found a very large partisan effect there, and parties are very aware of uh, simple changes that will have an effect on their vote cost. So even if you attack the, the perception of voters and you uh, could do something to change the winner-loser effect, it still doesn't mean that uh, changes in election legislation are going to be non-partisan because parties are very aware of uh, the effect of certain changes for their chances of winning. <laughs> 
Take one more question. Hi there, I'm Frederick Schoberg, Columbia University. Um, on that last, I had actually a question to Walter, but 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 on the question about uh, the perception of the confidence in the process and something that Thad brought up, I was just going to say that if you just simply compare uh, the fraud perception or the honesty of election uh, item on the Gallup World Poll uh, by electoral system, there's no difference in terms of electoral system. So it's not, it doesn't seem to be driven by a PR uh, uh, majority system. So I, I think the paper still needs to be written on, on, on that, and I know Pipa was presenting something last year on, on the very paradoxical patterns that you see in terms of these perceptions globally. But uh, to Walter, uh, impressive uh, work as always. Uh, would you uh, care to say something about uh, some of the other digit forensics tests? Uh, I know that you're focusing in your presentation on the Benford Law and the second digit, but did you run a last digit or some of the adjacency tests that, that some other papers here are going to be uh, using in the workshop? We'd just be interested to hear on that. Thanks. Why don't we give the panel, um, anyone care to respond? You guys want to talk? I'm good. I, I actually feel fine. I okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Couple, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Carr, uh, Michigan State University. Uh, Paul and, and Thad, I uh, really uh, respected the papers. I think um, you touched on some very good points. And I do work uh, linked to that in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of the questions I had for you is the utilization of, well, I think the issues more with Paul's work, it, utilization of mass opinion surveys that are collected after the results of the election have been known. And I'm wondering to what extent do you find that there's an endogeneity issue where individuals uh, their evaluations of their experience of the election are linked to um, their uh, that winner loser effect, okay, and the outcome of the election, and how that is going to influence the uh, relationships that we see uh, uh, coming out with the data. Well, I, uh, I yeah. And, and so the two thousand the two thousand American National Election Study was in the field. <laughs> during the controversial recount. Right. Up until the point where the courts resolved the matter, the parties were equally likely, Democrats and Republicans were equally likely to think it was fair. After the courts resolved the matter, Democrats overwhelmingly thought it was unfair, and Republicans overwhelmingly thought it was fair. I mean, we, I, I wouldn't call it an, an endogeneity. The reason that I took advantage of the pre-post structure of the CCES is precisely to try to tease out and separate the impact of winning and losing from something that may be independent of it. So that's why could most of the items that have been asked up to now are asked after the election. And so precisely for the reasons that you point out. So, so you can demonstrate an impact. There's some residual effect, partisan differences that Thad referred to, but there's clearly an impact of whether your candidate won or lost. So I, you well, know, I sh I struggle with that. I mean, I, I, what do I say to Steve's comment? I completely agree with him, but, but <laughs> right? You I, well, I don't. I disagree with all my other colleagues who we can. I mean, you've seen this idea. You can pull it out. Fundamental measure of election performance. Absolutely critical measure of 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 the way the process operates. That is my concern. Is that to the degree that these things are caught up with. Um, these kinds of effects about satisfaction with the eventual outcome. So what I would say to the first question is, it isn't a matter of teasing it out. If we're scholars trying to figure out how these opinions move, OK, I'm completely with you. But if we're trying to improve election performance, and we're speaking to a policymaker, and we tell them, well, just to have non-competitive elections, uh, you know, that, <laughs> I, again, I don't know what you have encountered in the comparative context having these kinds of conversations. The reason that. It's a concern in the U.S. is, again, to return you know, precisely for the reasons it's, that Steve notes. Voter confidence measures is, was cited by John Paul Stevens in a Supreme Court decision. I mean, and if it's a bad measure, we need to know. And we need to know what moves it. 
because decisions are going to be coming down the line that are based on these items. So sure, I'm happy to have a conversation about what it means to trust the process, to have confidence in the fairness, but I've been engaged as an expert witness. I mean, I, I, I have to know how these things move um, because real changes are impacting real people's access to the ballot box every election. So I think we have to parcel it apart. Well, let me answer it also in a slightly different way, which is that there is research also in the U.S. context where people, instead of asking these <coughs> survey questions like we do in the in the CCS, they do exit polling. So, for instance, there are people at BYU, Brigham Young University in the U.S., and I've worked with them where we do exit polling and you ask these types of questions. I mean, the problem there is, you know, it's just really costly to do that, right? And I don't have a, you know, I don't have two things. One, um, you know, it's hard to do something statewide or larger jurisdictionally. And secondly, um, in the U.S. context, we have a lot of people who vote absentee, or in the early voting context, then doing exit polling and early voting is very costly, and so you you run into that difficulty. But I do think you can get real, you can get very rich data on the experience in a polling place, and if you randomly select polling places in a jurisdiction, you can get very, you know, high quality data, and that so, and then it becomes a question of whether or not countries let you do exit polling. Which I'm, I'm, I'm doubting Africa has lots of laws on exit polling. So, yeah, I just want to say one thing in response to the question about last digits. Um, I haven't written that chapter up yet. Um, in Russia, which I also have to write up, uh, we use last digits of voter turnout. We being a grad student, Kirill Kalinin and I, in a series of papers, and we found that until the 2012 election, it was a great diagnostic of fraud tied to really large scale movements of public resources to buy votes. Um, he, Kirill talked to people in the Russian government administration. They asked carefully about how our test worked and everything. And uh, in 2012, it stopped working. Um, it worked in 2011, not 2012. So there's a problem with the digit test. It's like all things. They find stupid embezzlers, basically. Um, in the Iranian case, um, it didn't work out too well for the last digit. The technical point is that with precinct level data, often the last digit is the second digit. And I think the second digit is dominated either by Bumfer's law or by whatever I'm studying generally. But I have to sort through my evidence to see exactly what I want to say about all of that in, in different countries. What's the impact on the Russian work? I mean, it seems like you've thrown a bomb into a book and a half and a bunch of papers that are that make arguments about fraud occurring. No, we don't disagree. This. I mean, Mayakov and those guys, I agree that there's fraud. It's just a question of different tests. 